you can't visibly tell um, when you're hunting a deer whether or not it's, in, it's infected. You actually have to get it tested. And, you know, the problem with the government not informing Indigenous hunters, oh, yeah, you, you can bring your head here and, and we'll inform you. We're making it easier for, for nations to, you know, have their own testing sites. It, it creates a bit of a problem. I, I don't need to talk to more academics. Um, a lot of them don't understand uh, what I'm talking about because it's, you know, it's not their subject area or, you know, it's not something they're necessarily interested in. So I try to, as much as possible, disseminate to a public audience. Welcome back to another episode of Radical Narrative. I am your host, Mylan Tatusis. Today I'm sitting down with Arlana Bennett, a PhD candidate at the University of Alberta. Her research concentrates on chronic wasting disease. For some of you out there, you may know that chronic wasting disease is a growing concern on the prairie in both Alberta and Saskatchewan, but also generally in North America. But of course, this being Radical Narrative, we're going to have a specific conversation about Alberta and Saskatchewan. We talk about how the province is really dropping the ball in terms of informing Indigenous land-based users on this disease and how it's spreading. We also talk about the importance of testing deer for chronic wasting disease. I know a lot of people don't have the time or you refuse to. The reality is... It's getting crazy out here. Climate change is here. The land is changing. And we have to be vigilant and observe the land changes to keep ourselves safe, to keep our people safe, to keep our children safe. I no longer feed my daughter's deer unless I know it was tested. That's me personally. We're going to talk about that in this episode. But we also have a conversation about university life as PhD candidates, as grad students who are Indigenous. So all you nieces and nephews out there who are listening to this episode, who are doing your undergrad, we give some advice. We talk story about, you know, the struggles of what's going on. That was really beneficial. I'm really glad we had that conversation and it's here for you. Some of you may be wondering who is playing in the background. Well, this is Kamuela Enos. We sat down with him on a previous podcast. Turns out he has a creative side. He loves making music too. So he reached out and said, hey, Mylan, I have a creative side. I make music. Feel free to use some of this on your podcasts. And of course, we're going to oblige some amazing tracks here that you could listen to in upcoming episodes. And of course, we're still going to utilize our donated piece from the Boss of Three that will be coming out in future episodes also. So in the meantime, sit back, relax, do what you're doing, whether it be driving, skateboarding, beadwork, whatever our listeners do while they listen to us. As we bring you this pretty cool episode with Arlana Bennett on chronic wasting disease and university life. And I'm from rural Saskatchewan, right? So I'm from the Belt area, and we know it's an issue. And not many people are talking about it, like for for various reasons. I guess we'll jump into that. But mm-hmm. one of the reasons when when I, when I found out that you're doing research and your PhD work on chronic wasting disease, I was like, I need to sit down with her and have a con a conversation so people could hear yeah. this because it's super important, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, but why don't you go ahead and tell us about yourself, who you are, where you come from, however you want to introduce yourself in your own way. Yeah. Um, so I'm Arlana. Um, I am a Anishinaabe and I have um, German Scottish uh, on my mother's side. So I look predominantly white um, for the most part, unless you're indigenous and you can kind of, you can kind of tell, <laughs> um, but I grew up in BC uh, in the Kamloops area, so unceded Sowetmik territory. Uh, and then I moved to the Shushwap. And so I, I really, uh, re- really miss that territory. It's It kind of became really part of my identity um, when I was younger. I ended up moving to Alberta uh, after I graduated to pursue uh, BH, um, my Bachelor of Arts in uh, English. So that was my first degree. And then I did a second degree, a uh, bachelor's degree in honors sociology, where I focused on uh, environmental studies uh, kind of predominantly. And so that really pushed me towards uh, doing a master of science at the University of Alberta, where um, I worked with Brenda Parley. Um, and then I ended up working with Dr. Kim Talbert. 
Uh, she, Brenda, I'm not sure if you're familiar with her, but um, she happens to get a lot of uh, research projects going. And predominantly they are with um, Indigenous communities uh, on um, wildlife monitoring and management, uh, co-management, and basically anything to do with um, environmental studies in Indigenous communities. And so she had this uh, chronic wasting disease project. And, and for me, I hadn't um, landed on a project for, I think, almost two years into my master's degree. And it, it takes about two to three years to finish the Master of Science uh, in that program. And so the chronic wasting disease um, program kind of came up and I was like, oh, okay, this is interesting. So, so my interests predominantly are um, with kind of Indigenous issues, political issues, uh, more broadly. And so I like to intersect uh, environmental issues and then also um, Indigenous issues, Indigenous political issues. And so I found this project to be kind of a really good uh, marriage of the two because it hadn't really, uh, in terms of a kind of critical Indigenous perspective, hadn't been touched yet. And so it, it was really ripe for kind of that critical Indigenous analysis. And so I finished that um, doing the Master of Science. Um, I did an expert elicitation where I asked a bunch of, you know, wildlife biologists and conservationists and uh, management experts, economists and stuff, what they thought uh, about Indigenous engagement on the issue of chronic wasting disease. And of course, they gave me their opinions and, you know, spoiler, and it wasn't the greatest yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, opinions, but uh, it, it really kind of, you know, sparked some curiosity for me. And I thought, okay, well, I, I know I've always wanted to do a PhD and the University of Alberta, um, just as I was finishing my Master of Science, had opened up this uh, Indigenous Studies PhD program. I thought, wow, uh, talk about timing. Like, I already live here. <laughs> I've already kind of got a project that I'm still really interested in kind of carrying forward. And now you have this PhD program that's opening up. And so I applied um, and I got in. And it was kind of a, a bit of a stressful overlap because I was just finishing and then starting simultaneously. So I ended up having to pay tuition twice and it was just crazy. But um, yeah, it's it's been a really fantastic program. And I really appreciate now working with more Indigenous scientists, Indigenous scholars and theorists, um, whereas before, you know, my previous three degrees, I was working primarily with white people and and it was really um really informing to a detriment my perspective on a lot of things because i wasn't getting that indigenous perspective and so the shift to the uh, indigenous studies phd program was incredibly timely and and incredibly valuable to me cool but yeah that's me in a nutshell <laughs> yeah yeah and I, I love how you positioned um yourself and and the work you're doing and how it naturally just flowed into having chronic waste and disease as, as a topic for you because like i said i noticed exactly what you noticed too is that we're not being consulted about it as indigenous people like we a lot of people don't know about it first off mm -hmm. and, it, and, yeah. and and like the province in saskatchewan's really dropping the ball on dealing with it um and then also the phd life we do have a big uh, young undergrad following to that that follows us for the academic conversations or I guess the more you know um, formal conversations around university life so that's great yeah. so you're like the perfect guest for radical narrative that could bridge all this together for awesome. us yeah, yeah but <laughs> I want good. yeah, and and I want to get into the zombie deer conversation, right? Because we're sort of talking around chronic wasting disease, and I know some people know what it is, and others don't, and others are just getting informed. So so let's jump into that conversation. What is what is chronic wasting disease, and how come in the U.S. they're referring to it as zombie deer or like the zombie disease? So first of all, <laughs> and I like to clarify this for everyone, because I have seen this rhetoric pushed around, especially in the U.S., and it's starting to become a little bit more pervasive in, in Canada now, um, this zombie deer disease um, narrative that they're really pushing in the U.S. And, you know, it's it's just to get people alert and, and scared, just enough to kind of become active, which is kind of stupid. Um, in terms of risk communication, it's really the wrong way to go. 
But um, so it's not it's not zombie. It's not zombification of an animal. So the animal isn't dying and then coming back to life and walking around. It's basically just the animal is deteriorating such that it starts to look kind of like a zombie, kind of. Um, and then it it dies in in very um, dramatic and painful uh, way. Yeah. And then so how does this disease work? What is it? And and like, how does it impact the deer? So the disease itself um, is called a transmissible spongiform encephalophthy. It's a neurodegenerative disease. So it eats away at the brain and creates spongiform, which is sponge, a sponge like consistency of the brain and neural tissue. Um, it's not a virus. It's not a pathogen. It's a misfolded prion, which is a protein. So this isn't something that you can readily vaccinate away. Um, this isn't something that you can readily provide a medication for to get rid of or like any sort of medicated treatment. And also to do that on a large scale with wildlife would be almost impossible, I think. You would have to corral all the deer, you know, all the moose, all the elk. It's just not going to happen. It's not feasible. And so the disease itself is just a slow uh, degeneration of neural tissue, spinal cords. Um, It gets transmitted through lymph nodes, saliva, um, urine, blood, feces. The really unfortunate thing about this disease is that it stays bioavailable, so Uh, easily able to pick up in the environment um, in soils. So when animals shed the the prions, the infected prions, it stays available for, I think, about three years. So if you have a group of animals, for instance, like white-tailed deer or mule deer who tend to kind of congregate together uh, in the winter months, they're shedding prions into the soil, it's staying in the ground, Um, If new deer come into that area where you have deer that have shed a lot of prion into the the soil and it's kind of become stuck there because it sticks to clay, what will happen is the animals will come in, they'll, you know, eat some of the forage off of the ground, they'll end up picking up some of the soil, maybe even some fecal matter or, you know, whatever sort of fluids have been left around and then they become infected. And so it's kind of a, it's a really complicated and and complex issue. So getting rid of it in in the environment is going to be incredibly difficult, if not impossible. And so management isn't looking at um, eradicating it in wild populations because they can't. There's no funding for that. To do it would be like a monumental task. So at this point, what what they're saying, especially in Saskatchewan and uh, definitely here in Alberta, is that it's endemic. So it's kind of like at a a crisis point. And uh, they're basically just trying to contain it. And that's about it. Yeah, that's literally just about it, right? <laughs> it's like, mm-hmm. yeah. I said, yeah, and I, I met you on a meeting, a con- like, I guess, an informal consultation where they're just consulting land users and things like that. And, and I heard you talking about this. And, and that's literally the conversations I picked up too was not much is happening with chronic waste and disease, but, it, but it's out there. And it, like you say, it's in the soil. Um, it impacts predominantly cervids, so like, like deer, elk, um, potentially moose also. Um, and, and so I guess we could d- jump into the conversation of, of where did this come from? Because when I do bring it up with local hunters or even elders, the, it's news to them locally. Like they don't remember it specifically being in the area and it's kind of shocking for them. Um, and then also at the same time, well, let's just start with that. Like where did, where did it come from? Because it's not technically, it hasn't been here before by the sounds of it when people hear about it. No. So Uh, it's kind of an interesting conversation um, and there's not a lot of research around this, but if you kind of read between the lines, you can get a little bit of a sense of of where this really emerged from. And to be kind of clear, my, you know, hypothesis, my theory is that where chronic wasting disease really came from was from holding deer and elk captive um, in cervid farms, because you see, I think it was in the 1970s, the late 1970s when it first popped up. Um, and there's two forms, 
of this uh, chronic wasting disease, I guess you could say. So there's the um, sporadic, which happens kind of naturally. An animal will just all of a sudden develop a misfolding prion, just random genetics, and it will succumb to chronic wasting disease, possibly infecting other animals. And then there's the uh, transmissible form, which comes from one animal. Um, they believe it came from sheep, so sheep scrapey, and then tr was um, exposed to a, a captive cervid, which was, I think, either in some sort of research facility or possibly uh, in a farm. I can't quite remember. And so, you know, cut to 10, 20, 30 years later, we have this kind of proliferation of cervid farms, game farms, especially in the United States. You have people um, shipping cervids across the country at mm -hmm. this point early on. There's no um, management review or, you know, watching over the, the transportation of, you know, a, a truck full of animals from one state to another state. They're, you know, traveling across borders into Canada, which is where it came from in Canada. Uh, it actually came from Colorado, I believe, oh, wow. in a service shipment that came, um, I think, first to Saskatchewan. Uh, and so, you know, the, the transportation and the unnatural corralling of um, cervids in these situations where they're in unnatural settings uh, to what they're accustomed to genetically, uh, it's just a disaster. And yeah. so, you know, I see a lot in Alberta, and I'm not sure if this is the case in, in Saskatchewan, but I see uh, on the highways, you can see like elk farms. Yeah. And there's deer farms. And, and so these um, farms have become incredibly popular. You see them sometimes at, at farmers markets and whatnot, where, you know, there's elk available, and it's, you know, just kind of this rural Alberta thing. Um, if you check the USGS uh, CWD map, you can see there's yellow spots, and those are the spots where uh, farms, cervid farms, have, I believe, depopulated or had positive confirmed cases of chronic wasting disease in their stocks. And then shortly after, you will see from that area um, cases, positive cases of wild uh, cervids becoming infected. Yeah. And so at this point, it's kind of hard to tell whether or not, you know, is it the wild um, cases of CWD coming into the, you know, captive cervid farms, or is it the captive cervids who have come from wherever, um, who may or may not have already been infected, then infecting the, um, the wild populations. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, it's, it's really, I don't know, it's a bit of a quagmire because nobody has an answer, or at least nobody's talking about it. Yeah. And I think a lot of that has to do with the kind of economics of um, cervid farming and how it's kind of a revenue generator. And the province of Alberta, I don't think, is going to shut that down anytime soon, which is really unfortunate. And I, I know on the Saskatchewan side, the conversation is who's going to flip the bill then for all these elk farms if they do have to depopulate or get rid of whatever they're they're doing with them. Um, mm -hmm. And so there's always barriers with those conversations. So yeah, economically, it just sounds like no one wants to flip the bill or have a real conversation about dealing with it on this side. Right. Um, and, and for me, it's just like, this is like, obviously a settler colonial issue <laughs> like it, it, it yes. reeks of like you could apply a decolonial colonial framework to this conversation and it applies <laughs> it's like yes. wow this is this is like an end time scenario <laughs> in my mind mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um and i guess like the big question too that when when i explain this to people who aren't familiar with it because a lot of like locally a lot of hunters subsistence hunt um yeah. and and the question they ask is is can it impact humans mm -hmm. and so Research shows, and, and the most recent research, I think up to this this year, um, it hasn't it hasn't been transmitted from cervid to human. And there was actually a case in the United States. Um, I'm not sure if it was the U.S. or if it was around Wisconsin or something. Where, and I think it's Wisconsin where it's kind of become really endemic. Um, there was a case of. Um, an employer had a party and they served uh, venison, I believe it was. And it turns out that the, the venison was actually infected with chronic wasting disease. And so there were about, I think, 80, 80 people who had consumed it 
at the very least. And so they followed them for an extended period of time to see, you know, are they going to develop um, the Creutzfeldt Jakob disease, which is the, the human form of um, prion disease. And so they found uh, that nobody actually developed any symptoms whatsoever. And some people, you know, had passed on and whatnot and, and showed no symptoms, no neurodegenerative um, symptoms whatsoever in the brain or the spinal cord or anything. And so um, we do know, you know, in a research setting in a lab that it, it is incredibly difficult to infect uh, mice with um, who, who have human uh, prion receptor with uh, chronic wasting disease. And so there's a good chance it's not going to happen. <laughs> there's, there's a possibility that, you know, for the people who don't get their heads tested and who may or may not have already consumed uh, possibly infected meat, they're probably not going to die of chronic wasting disease r- mm-hmm. related issues. Um, but it is something to be worried about because if you, you know, you continue pushing that barrier and you have more and more people, you know, over an extended period of time um, consuming infected me, who knows, right? You, yeah. you can't really tell. Yeah, totally. And, and I think that's my concern too. Even when you add the conversation on climate change into it, like how the prairie region is, is changing drastically. And in my mind, like deer populations, like migratory patterns, where they're gathering, where they're congregating, that's a real concern. Because in my region, they're, they're always removing trees to increase crop yields. <laughs> mm-hmm. And, mm-hmm. and so it's like the, the deer and, and cervids are using the valleys more and more. Um, and, and there's game trails, like there's little game trails <laughs> and just from like the land-based user perspective, yeah. in my mind, it's like, yeah, this is leading in a direction where, where like an endemic s- scenario is also plausible here. Like we literally, it, it, it's possibly here. I know, I know in the region, in the Mason area, deer have tested positive. Um, I do have two close friends who hunt, whose heads tested positive and, and they didn't want to eat the the meat and now it's we're having these philosophical conversations around yeah we, we want to hunt but like how how far down this rabbit hole are we going to the point of where we feel comfortable and safe doing it <laughs> because for me as a father like I'm, I'm not going to feed my daughter's deer meat unless it's tested right now because again like you said you know obviously it's not jumping to humans yet but but we just can't we just don't know in the future you know and what if it does eventually or what if something happens where the environment just triggers something um so i get nervous about that um but like i said the game trails are there deer congregate and um they 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 mingle so in my mind it's there like it's out there and, and, and with that reason, that's why like I shift focus to, to moose every year or ideally wanting to get a moose every year. Right. And so um, moose, for whatever reason, there's probably a genetic reason, uh, are a little bit more resilient to chronic wasting disease. So you don't see it as often in moose. And that you know could also be a result of social factors because moose tend to not congregate in large groups. Um, they tend to be kind of solo-ish uh, creatures that, you know, wander around and, and may or may not come across um, uh, CWD infected environment. And so moose have a little bit more resilience in that way. But deer, uh, deer is such a big problem at this point yeah. because it's, you can't visibly tell um, when you're hunting a deer, whether or not it's, in, it's infected, you actually have to get it tested. And, you know, the problem with the government, not, informing indigenous hunters oh yeah you you can bring your head here and and we'll inform you we're making it easier for for nations to you know have their own testing sites It, it creates a bit of a problem and so i i see you know a lot of people possibly turning away from hunting deer and you know it's really unfortunate because i know you know deer is it's not as important um, as moose, moose is a little bit more important, especially if you're a subsistence hunter, Mm -hmm. you know, getting a moose is, is like, hooray, (laughs) you know, but um, deer, deer is kind of important too. And so the anthropogenic um, issues, you know, in terms of development, especially agriculture, um, which I find is kind of a confounding issue with chronic wasting disease. Uh, a lot of the cut lines you see going up north, like this yeah. is potentially a problem for caribou. Yeah. 
Mm. We do know that caribou is susceptible to develop, to developing chronic wasting disease. So, you know, the, the one way that it could possibly migrate north into really vulnerable caribou herds would be, you know, potentially through white-tailed deer and through, um, you know, human development, cutting all these trees down, making the landscape more, um, you know, attractive to deer kind of wandering through. Right. Yeah. Yeah, totally. Totally. And, and, and I guess it's like a, like, I don't have the answers. I'm, I'm just posing these questions for everyone to, to begin to think about it and raise awareness around it. Um, and I guess like the conversation too is, is, well, I, I what I want to highlight too, is I do know that testing in Saskatchewan sucks. Um, yes. I did contact the vet college at USASC and they're more than willing to accommodate, you know, my heads and, and local people. So they'll mm-hmm. say, you know, you could bring them in here, but going through the province was just bad for some people. They didn't like it. Um, there was delayed and the reality with a lot of indigenous hunters that subsistence hunt is that they, there may be like, well, let's theoretically say I have a friend who has a criminal record <laughs> and and yeah. can't technically hunt legally, <laughs> mm. but they're subsistent hunting. So it's like, yeah. oh, am I going to go put my name on this sheet with my address and say I have this head and um, and and submit this head for testing? Or am I going to just, you know, smoke it and give it to my kids next week? Yeah. Um, it's it's kind of like, obviously, we're going to eat the meat we need to eat, right? So there's like social and political factors in play in these conversations that, that aren't coming up in the meetings I've observed and heard about. Yeah. So like, I guess, like, just to clarify, like technically not being able to utilize a firearm legally, like not allowed to be around them because of mistakes you made as a young kid, but now you're actually literally subsistent hunting and, and even not even having the finances to, to get, um, um, a proper rifle, you know what I mean? So there's, there's like, like I said, there's tons of social political factors in this issue that are, that are, aren't being considered when we have these conversations. I, so I find, yeah, I mean, that the criminal record thing, yeah, I mean, anybody should be able to hunt, right? And you shouldn't be worried that if you go out and hunt and you, you know, you need to get your head tested, that somebody's going to snitch on you and get you hauled away. That shouldn't be the case. But then again, you know, that's the distrust of, you know, indigenous people of governments is that, well, yeah, historically, there is a record there of them doing that kind of stuff. Yeah, and then at the same time, it's it's about community safety. It's about health, even like we we don't know what the future looks like with chronic waste and disease. So, like, what do you recommend then? Like, what do you recommend in terms of how people should forcefully navigate through this system, in terms of safety? You know, I I would definitely encourage people to get their heads tested. There's a lot of barriers to that, though. Um, I know in Alberta, you know, they have these green cards that you fill out. And they make a little spot there for your, um, your treaty number or mm-hmm. your, you know, your, <laughs> your INAC number. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and so I'm like, okay, you, how many people are going to want to give out that sensitive information? Exactly. Um, you know, it, it's kind of, I don't know, it's not attractive to a lot of people. So there are barriers in terms of people, indigenous people getting their heads tested in terms of distrust, in terms of not wanting to get o- give over private information, um, in terms of not knowing where to go, where to take your heads. And then there's also the kind of social cultural component too, where, you know, you have a moose, should you get the head tested, but you, you need the moose nose for moose nose soup. You need it for ceremony or something, right. Or like you need the brain of deer or moose to, to tan hide, you know, you don't want to give that away because then it's gone. Mm -hmm. And then what are you going to do? Right. Yeah. And then to assume that deer or elk has chronic waste and disease in the brain. You know, that, that also opens up other issues too, is like, um, you have a possibly or not possibly infected animal, you're using the brain to tan the hide. Is that safe? There are no protocols for that. You know, the government hasn't set out any protocols for anyone in terms of using these parts of the animal because predominantly you have non-Indigenous hunters who are using these and they're, you know, perfectly willing to give up the head as long as they can take the antlers. They don't really care. So, you know, it's things like that that kind of confound me a little bit.
I feel like I'm in the same boat because, and that's why I'm like reaching out to people to have conversations about this with, because it's like, we're in a new uncharted territory, um, with it being in our territory. Because before you, I mean, there was a time where deer populations were low when like, like a few decades ago as a result of like settler colonialism, but now that they're, they're doing okay, more people are leaning towards hunting. And it's like this revigoration of hunting practices too for a lot of people wanting to decolonize or wanting to get tied to a land-based practice again. So they're leaning towards hunting. And we've done a lot of, we've done a few hunting episodes where we, we hosted some people. And, and I feel that's why I wanted to throw in the CWD conversation in, in the podcast list too, because yeah, it's, it's like a new conversation. <laughs> oh yeah, no, it's, I mean, in terms of communicating a lot of this information to indigenous communities, like it just, it's not being done. And it's, it's kind of piecemeal in uh, Alberta where you have, you know, researchers like uh, my advisor, Brenda Parley, who's kind of filling in some of those gaps for certain communities that she works with. Um, but for the most part, like the province here, uh, Alberta Fish and Wildlife is not talking to First Nations. And their position is that nations have to come to the province in order to get this information. That is not how nation to nation relationships work. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, yeah. that is not fostering trust. That is not, you know, supporting communities. If anything, it's an incredible detriment. And so that relationship is already strained. You have problems with, you know, people not knowing about chronic wasting disease um, and the risk factors associated with that. Like that is a provincial obligation Yeah, is to communicate to the people, the risk factors associated with consuming the animals and how to get them tested and how to, you know, strip an animal down properly. So as not to, to risk yourself or spread it in the environment. And so I see both, you know, Alberta and Saskatchewan handling this quite poorly. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they do. I did, I, in all honesty and all transparency, I did reach out to the province to jump on the podcast too. And they referred me to media relations. <laughs> so I think that's kind of like leads, like explains exactly what we're up against. Um, yeah. not, like not even to have a personal conversation as a scientist, you know what I mean? Or somebody who's yeah. has, has expertise in the field. It's like, no, we you need to go through the media relations and then they'll refer you to us. And it's like, what? <laughs> Yeah, yeah. So kind of a canned response. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. it's it's really unfortunate. Um, I know in Alberta here, there's um, a kind of what they call um, delegated administrative organizations. So interestingly enough, the um, Hunters Outfitters Society here is a DAO, which is kind of an arm's length um, government agency. And they're outfitters. And so they're you know, they're in direct communication with the province on getting research done, on um, getting testing, and, like, basically the province is catering directly to these these groups, these DAOs. There's uh, a couple research bodies and conservation groups, and, and they're predominantly made up of non-Indigenous peoples. And so what they do is they say, okay, well, we have one seat for all of Treaty 8, And so you have to bring forward a member of Treaty 8 who's willing to sit on um, one of these boards and say yay or nay to a lot of, you know, the kind of the motions they pass and, you know, directives for future research and monitoring on whatever issue it happens to be. And so to me, that's, I find really insulting because um, basically what they're looking for is a treaty member uh, of Treaty 8, for instance, to come and sit on their board and basically just kind of give check mark consultation. Um, if that person comes yeah. from Treaty 8, then yay, we've consulted and, you know, we don't have to worry about the Indigenous population. That in, in no way is uh, sufficient f- for, you know, dealing with an issue um, to the extent that chronic wasting disease is for nations. It's a really, I don't know, there's a lot of racism going on. Yeah. <laughs> like, I'll just, I'll just say it like, you know, the provinces, Saskatchewan and Alberta, I don't think care about um, Indigenous nations, or if they do, they, you know, prefer not to interfere. And, and maybe they feel that by not interfering, that they're, they're doing them a favor, but really, like, it just looks really bad. 
Yeah, it does. And then, and for me, it's like an, it's an ongoing settler colonial dynamic. So it's like measurable. It's there. And when I, when I have this conversation, I think about it, I'm like, this is colonialism. This is like colonization straight up. Yeah. Um, so I guess I'll ask that you ask that as a question to you is, is, is chronic wasting disease tied to settler colonialism? I think the management of chronic wasting disease for sure is, is tied to these kind of settler colonial institutions and ideas, ideologies of wildlife, wildlife management and wildlife conservation. And so the North American wildlife management framework that uh, both the US and Canada use um, was designed in such a way to explicitly curtail the sale of um, an economic use of wildlife. So, you know, moose, deer, elk, and all of that um, would be considered in there. And so I think strongly that shows that they were um, trying to keep Indigenous people from making a living off of the sale of animals and also mm -hmm. to kind of curb the um, basic, basically the extinguishment of these animal species. Because you had, in some cases, historically, uh, Indigenous people who were going out in order to, you know, survive uh, were uh, overkilling in some cases um, some of these animals and it wasn't because they were reckless it's because they were being throttled by you know the RCMP and the Canadian government the emerging Canadian government um, such that they needed to you know support their families and their communities so if you're getting money to to kill a bunch of animals of, of course you're going to do that yeah. so Historically, you know, the provinces, especially Alberta and, and Saskatchewan to, to a degree, and then also the Northwest Territories too, have this really terrible track record of um, treating Indigenous peoples so poorly, mm -hmm. especially when it comes to um, hunting and harvesting rights. Yeah, yeah, totally. It all makes sense how you're explaining it in that whole umbrella approach that was sort of just applied by settler colonial paradigms around land and, and land use and, and, and wildlife. And like for me too, like when I hear you talking about this, I keep thinking about like land back co concepts that people are promoting. But then at the same time, it's like that's a really romantic notion these days because for me, like mm -hmm. land back would literally be addressing chronic waste and disease conversations or having a united front against this type of settler colonial approach. Right, exactly. And I think in terms of land back, because I'm trying to, you know, think through the idea and the lens of land back in terms of management of wildlife diseases. And so so what is land back in, in the context of chronic wasting disease? Well, I think what that means is that it's giving Indigenous nations the right to manage and monitor the disease on their own terms yeah. and not have to wait for the province to come and, and you know, give them the information that they need. And so what, you know, what would that look like? Ideally, that would look like nations having enough funding to do research with universities and coordination um, to monitor and develop new uh, testing strategies on, on the land in order to help, you know, hunters, Indigenous hunters, uh, determine whether or not in real time they have an infected animal. That way they don't have to submit the whole head and give it to, you know, fish and wildlife and then find out in a couple months whether or not, you know, the animal meat that they have in their freezer is good or not. Like it, it's, to me, land back also means Indigenous peoples being able to be in control of determining whether or not something is safe for them. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, totally. I agree. <laughs> that's it on the point. Like that's on point. I love it. <laughs> Mm. Yeah, and I think like especially where I'm at now with like being a father, living out in my traditional territory, a little bit older in age, um, like you know my mid 30s now. It's like I'm starting to think more structurally about these things in terms of infrastructure. Like, yeah. like yeah, I I could go out there and yell land back all I want, but I need to know what I'm going to be doing when right. when we get that back or what type of systems are in play, and and that's what comes up to for me in these conversations. And everything you're saying is just like this is the direction <laughs> like that's we need that infrastructure we need those systems we need and if we can't even come up with testing strategies then i think we need to reflect on that you know what i mean like if we can't come up with a way to mitigate this then that we need to have a really big self assessment about our nationhood <laughs> yeah and i think you know there is a role for non indigenous researchers scientists and institutions to to help support um, indigenous nations in, in this regard. And so it's a matter of doing that work, but in such a way that the nation is guiding 
the directions mm-hmm. and the outcomes um, yeah. for the nation explicitly. And so, you know, in research, you see a lot of this work kind of being done in different uh, in different fields, but you have like two-eyed seeing, for instance, where a lot of kind of researchers are trying to work with Indigenous knowledge and Indigenous communities, but in a way that's more quote unquote decolonial. Yeah. Um, I think we need to be focusing more on the anti-colonial frameworks yeah. and we need to take the, uh, the knowledge and the resources and funding and everything that these non-Indigenous institutions have. And we need to give the keys and the control over to Indigenous nations to then, you know, develop the questions, uh, guide the research and then, you know, reap the results for themselves. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. I like it. I like it. That's really cool. Um, so uh, one question that comes up for me is, is why do you, f- what, what are your thoughts on why people aren't concentrating on chronic wasting disease? Because it seems like it's, it's not on people's radar in general. And then when you do bring it up, especially with even like local land based users, they're, they're surprised to hear about it. <laughs> I think a lot of that has to do with the lack of communication. Um, I know here in Alberta, So again, the DAOs, uh, which are predominantly non-Indigenous, are getting up-to-date information regularly about chronic wasting disease. And a lot of that has to do with the fact that they are arm's length uh, government organizations. They are non-Indigenous, coincidentally, and that's me being sarcastic. Mm -hmm. (laughs) But a lot of it has to do with the government wants to see and support servid the servid economy and so they don't want to curtail that in any way and part of that servid economy is also the hunting economy indigenous people predominantly don't pay into the hunting economy the way that non-indigenous people do so they're not as much of an economic uh generator Mm -hmm. and so i think part of that has to do with why they're not communicating with them as much and that and they you know possibly think that indigenous harvesting um is just not something they should be concerned about or doesn't happen or you know it could be any number of things yeah. um i think it's reflective of this kind of racist um wildlife management perspective of just not communicating with indigenous people because you feel you don't have to or because it's too complicated or because 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 i'm, I'm sure they have yeah. lots of reasons And so I think that's why a lot of people are kind of uninformed about it is because number one, they're not getting the information that they need to be getting because Mm -hmm. they happen to be indigenous, (laughs) Um, you know, and part of it too, I'm I'm not sure how responsible um, nations themselves, you know, band offices should be for, you know, reaching out and getting that information for themselves, because I think the provinces would prefer that nations came to them to get the information and quote Mm -hmm. unquote be taught um you know everything about chronic wasting disease and so there's this kind of paternalistic uh perspective as well that tends to happen with um wildlife management yeah totally it it all makes sense it all makes sense and of course there's ongoing colonialism and settler colonialism so i have a question um there was an article that came out where they figure that some deer did have COVID-19 and do carry COVID-19. Um, can you explain that to us? And ultimately, what are your thoughts on that? So, yeah, there was some testing done in the U.S. And, and what they found out is that there are white-tailed deer um, showing antibodies for uh, SARS-CoV-2, which is COVID, COVID-19, right? And so... Um, basically what they're speculating is that, um, though the wild populations of deer somehow contracted COVID-19, most likely by coming into contact with people or other animals that were carrying, um, the virus. And so, I mean, in, in my mind, because humans are everywhere and also because, um, you know, we're, we're farming um, deer, for example, deer and elk. Um, and deer are attracted to feed from agricultural lots. Um, my theory is that it probably, um, what happened was, is the deer were coming into contact with feed from an agricultural lot, either that was um, deer or cow or, or whatever, and the animal was in, infected on the agricultural side um, with COVID and then the deer picked it up and then kind of 
transmitted it through the wild population. Um, there's also possible speculation that it could be an environmental contamination. Um, there are there is research at the University of uh, Calgary where they're testing uh, water samples, municipal water samples for uh, COVID, signs of COVID-19. So it is um, maybe possible that it's in the water supply, although at, at what level um, is really kind of up for debate. Like it, it might not be transmissible that way. Um, the filtration systems could be, you know, cleaning it out. So I, I don't know that that's the way that um, white-tailed deer are picking it up. My my strong belief is that they're they're picking it up from um, domestic livestock um, and then kind of spreading it about in in the wild population. Yeah, yeah, totally. And I think that's just like the reality of of being in a pandemic. You don't really know <laughs> until you get the hindsight clarity, right? And it's just kind of just like rolling with the punches right now. Right. And so the thing is, is like, it's not just white tailed deer that, that are getting it, that are showing antibodies for, for SARS-CoV-2. It's, you know, um, cats, dogs, mink. Um, mink is an especially interesting one. Um, in uh, Scandinavia, like um, Northern Europe, on mink farms where they were um, contracting SARS-CoV-2, uh, it was spreading throughout the mink population, and then it was starting to spread back into the human population from the mink. Um, the interesting thing with mink, and, and I don't know too much about the science and genetics behind why this happens, but um, when mink tend to pick up certain pathogens, viruses, um, and, and this has been shown in um, prion disease, chronic wasting disease. Um, it tends to mutate more rapidly with um, in, in mink populations, and I don't know exactly why, but that's kind of what ended up happening with um, SARS-CoV-2 is that in the mink populations, the, the farmed mink populations, it started spreading rapidly, and, and there were concerns and i don't know um exactly if there were mutations uh in the mink population uh widespread but it it was jumping back into the human population and, and so we have to consider um these domestic livestock animals and the implications of disease spread um to humans and then back to animals and like how this can kind of proliferate and then jump to wild populations and so it's it's a disaster to be honest, and I and I don't see a lot of people really kind of talking about this um, because the you know agricultural industries that that involve animal products typically, you know, they just kind of want to keep it going because it, it is so lucrative, right? Yeah, totally. And I think that's sort of like one of the reasons why we want to have this conversation, especially for our listeners who are hunters and land based people, is that it's something we have to take into consideration constantly to and just get the dialogue going amongst our communities because like we highlighted it in the podcast is that we're not really at the table or we're not on the forefront of these discussions no not at all and you know the the really uh, the thing that kind of puts me at ease though with with this kind of jumping between species um and this is how these things start in the first place they come from animals they jump to people and then back and forth um is that it's not you know, it's in white-tailed deer, but they're not spreading it to people, which which is great. Um, and we don't know yet whether or not this is killing the deer. Um, we do know that if you consume deer that have had uh, SARS-CoV-2, you're most likely not going to get it. Um, so the risk is very low. And so that's kind of maybe a bit of a silver lining. But the fact of the matter is, is it, it kind of brings our attention back to the matter of, okay, well, as people, we are spreading this disease, not just amongst ourselves, but we're also spreading it to animal populations. The implications for that, um, you know, further on down the line could be problematic, but so far, not yet. Yeah. Yeah, totally. Awesome. Cool. Is there anything you'd like to add about the COVID-19 and deer conversation? Because I think that's pretty solid, everything we got there. Yeah, no, I, I think I think that's about it. It's just basically, you know, alerting people to the fact that, you know, you don't have to worry about eating deer if, if you think it may or may not have SARS-CoV-2, <laughs> um, you know, COVID-19. Um, be more concerned about um, chronic wasting disease and definitely have your animals tested. And, you know, if you're breaking down an animal, definitely wear gloves. Um, 
but other than that, I, I think it's, you know, it's okay at this point and it's not anything to be specifically alarmed about. Yeah. Yeah. The initial alarm was like, whoa, that's interesting. And then when we dive into the conversations, it sounds like it's, you know, it's, it's, it's interesting, but not as alarming as some people would initially have thought. No. And, and I was kind of, um, you know, wondering where the conversation was going to go and if it was going to, you know, devolve into, oh God, we have to cull all these animals because they're going to spread COVID-19 everywhere. (laughs) So, you know, that's not the case. Um, That might be the case with like cats and dogs because they're getting it as well. Right. So, you know, we're not going to go out and put all our cats and dogs down because they're spreading COVID-19. It's, it, it doesn't, a lot of these, um, you know, animals that pick up COVID-19, they're, they're not spreading it to the human populations. It's kind of just, you know, running its course through their populations and then that's about it. So, you know, we're all kind of collectively experiencing this pandemic um, (laughs) and nobody really knows, you know, how the animals are faring. Yeah. And there's lots of considerations here. Like I said, part of the reason why we wanted to have this podcast is because there are land-based practitioners who listen to this and indigenous hunters who, who are, thinking critically about the landscape, the politics and the economics in our territories. And and this is all part of that conversation. And that's why I wanted to have you here to have a conversation around chronic waste and disease and ultimately even Mm COVID-19 and deer now. Um, But also on on the other side of the equation for the podcast is we have a lot of like um, young up and coming scholars that listen to these episodes too. Um, Mm -hmm. And just in, 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 in terms of your approach and your research, is there anything that you learned or anything that was surprising to you in terms of doing research on chronic waste and disease and I guess in general, the prairies? Yeah. Um, I mean, there was quite a bit, um, being an indigenous, researcher, indigenous PhD student, um, especially in my, my master's degree, it it was kind of interesting for me. Um, because again, I don't, I don't necessarily look that indigenous, Mm -hmm. even though I have a status card and, you know, (laughs) um, so for me, um, I did some interviews with some non-indigenous people and they didn't know I was indigenous. So they were just talking their talk about, you know, some kind of shady stuff about indigenous people. And to be an indigenous researcher sitting here listening to these people, you know, go on about kind of disparaging things about indigenous people. And so, you know, there was no, um, there was no talk about that with my advisor or my department about, you know, how do we handle this? Um, how, how do I go ahead then and analyze, analyze this, yeah. um, impartially, <laughs> yeah. you know? And so that, that was a bit of a shock for me. Um, you know, there's, there's other shocks to the, the institution itself, depending on, on what, um, faculty or department you have to happen to be in may or may not be as accommodating, um, in terms of dealing or helping support, um, you know, faculty, students of color. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, moving from one department that was predominantly, um, non-Indigenous, but had some Indigenous students feeling kind of alienated and not supported to a certain degree, and then moving over to uh, a faculty that was predominantly Indigenous feeling, you know, seen and and more um, supported in that way was definitely a bit of a relief. You know, these institutions are very challenging and uh, difficult for especially Indigenous people to navigate because they are so incredibly colonial. Yeah. Yeah, especially like being on the front line and having to sit with like settler colonialism. It sounds like that was really challenging. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. So so as a researcher, as an indigenous researcher, who do you identify as your audience? Like who do you see interacting with your your work on chronic voice and disease the most? I try to as much as possible do talks um, with nations um, or organizations that are associated, uh, umbrella organizations that are associated with nations. Um, I like to think that whatever talk I'm giving um, is clear and concise enough that somebody on like Onion Lake can understand what I'm saying. Mm Um, Because I'm trying to reach to those people because they're the ones who need the information, right? I I don't need to talk to more academics. Um, A lot of them don't understand um, what I'm talking about because it's, you know, it's not their subject area or, you know, it's not something they're necessarily interested in. So I try to, as much as possible, disseminate to a public audience. Mm 
Nice. Nice. Yeah, totally. And I, that's like the goal with radical narrative too, is, is we try to avoid like the, the big academic speak. <laughs> yeah. We try to yeah. make it, you know, grounded in terms of getting our information across. Um, that's awesome. Um, and then in terms of chronic wasting disease and just academia in general, I guess, like not so much your research with chronic wasting disease, but how did you navigate the low points in terms of doing your thesis or being in academia? Because um, especially during the pandemic, a lot of our listeners found their way to our podcast during challenging times. A lot of the undergrads did that and they, you know, mm-hmm. they DM'd us and said, hey, cool episode. It kind of found some motivation for me. Um, but how did you deal with the low points in terms of your academic career? <laughs> Yeah, so so COVID has been super interesting. <laughs> um, I mean, as a master's and PhD student, uh, when you're a graduate student, you're typically kind of on an island of your own for a part of your degree anyway. So for me, I was like, oh, okay, COVID, this, this is no different than what I've been doing for the past couple of years anyway. <laughs> so, you know, the isolation was something I'd kind of already been prepared for, but I know some of my colleagues had a really hard time with it because they're more accustomed to being on campus. They're more accustomed to going to talks and and being in that kind of social milieu, so to speak. Um, I typically tend to handle isolation well, um, although, you know, the low points, I would say I definitely had to work with my therapist a lot more um, Mm -hmm. because anxiety comes up anyway. We're we're social people, um, especially as Indigenous people. A lot of us have trauma. And that too is something that Mm -hmm. um, has kind of cropped up during this whole COVID experience, Um, possibly as a result of isolation, possibly as a result of just long-term stress and then going into a period of minimal stress and and minimal social contact. And now all of a sudden, you know, my body was like, oh, okay, we're resting. This is great. All your trauma, all your stress is going to come out of your body now and we're going to just deal with it now. And so, you know, navigating the, the kind of, uh, breakdown and anxiety and stress and everything during COVID and, and also trying to keep going, um, in terms of making progress in your degree is incredibly challenging. And so I can definitely, you know, relate to a lot of people who have that kind of experience. Um, you know, I have a couple of colleagues who have the same kind of experience have re- had a really challenging time, possibly for different reasons. M- most of them, um, definitely different reasons, but, um, definitely find a, if you're an ind- indigenous person, find a good indigenous therapist, um, or somebody who is trained under the residential school mental health program, um, which I found out about, I think a, a couple of years ago. Um, that there are specific therapists you can access who are trained uh, under that program to bill um, non-insured health benefits, I think it is. Or there's, oh no, there's a separate uh, separate pot of monies for uh, survivors of residential schools and their um, their descendants and their family members. And so finding that has been a lifesaver um, nice. only because therapy outside of the um, therapy that's available at the institution at, at University of Alberta and other other um, universities, I'm sure, is not sufficient um, for Indigenous peoples. And I've complained about this quite a bit um, in my career so far. Uh, we need we need specific um, types of of healing modalities, and a lot of these aren't read, readily available in um, the institutional setting. They don't account for it. And so I, I had to spend a year um, looking for uh, my first therapist, and then I moved on to another one who is um, Indigenous and, and dealing with Indigenous issues predominantly. So, you know, I, I advocate for undergrads and new grad students to, even if you're not feeling it right now, or if you have been, look out for those uh, programs, those uh, therapists, because you're going to need it. Yeah. <clears throat> That's awesome. I love how we normalize this conversation because that's some of the insights and conversations I like to have too, honestly, 
mm-hmm. is that we need a lot of like mental health support just in terms of not only academia, but just like you say, the struggles of being indigenous and resolving trauma as we're moving forward, working in an institutionalized space. And yeah, it, the mental health within those institutions is not adequate for a lot of our, our people, especially undergrads. And, and, and I'm, I'm on a position that specifically for our undergrad audience too, is that, is that it's okay to ask for help. Like we're, we're grad students, so we're both PhD, P, doing our PhD and, and we lean on mental health more, I feel, than on academic support. Oh, for sure. You know, it, it's been, um, at, at first it was kind of, you know, you're, you're lost in the weeds and you're like, oh God, I'm, I'm going to go access the, you know, the university's mental health um, supports and predominantly they're counselors, counselors with no First Nations training yeah. whatsoever. Exactly. So it's kind of like, oh, okay, great. <laughs> you know, you go to the um, Indigenous Student Services or whatever happens to be on your university. And it's like, okay, well, there's an elder to talk to, but that elder is not necessarily trained in, in trauma response. Yeah. And so, you know, for me, it's been incredibly difficult. And I see this with a lot of Indigenous um, academics coming up is that we have to navigate not only the the research and the stress of doing research and, and doing a program, but we also have to be um, teaching ourselves and unlearning a lot of this colonial trauma mm-hmm. that comes with, you know, part of this. And so it's like you're doing two PhDs at once. Yeah. You're doing the PhD of healing yourself from colonial trauma, and you're doing the PhD of, of criticizing um, the, the Canadian government or the yeah. U.S. government for what they've done to us. So, you know, I, I feel like I should be getting a second doctorate at the yeah. end of this. <laughs> totally. Totally. And I'm a long hauler with my PhD. Like I'm the department snail, I say. But mm-hmm. literally everything I'm working on is personal. <laughs> like yeah. the political commentary, my political ecology approach, that's based off like living in a colonial world and navigating the chaos. It's not like I could sit in a library and hash this out in, in a semester type thing. It's literally like lived experience. Yeah. And I find it, you know, kind of the expectations of how long you have to to, to finish these degrees, really unrealistic, especially for Indigenous students. Like mm-hmm. a lot of us are, you know, we're thrust into these programs with inadequate support and we're put under these time constraints that are only possibly realistic for people who have no pre-existing mental health issues or, or you know, yeah. trauma whatsoever. You know, not to say that, you know, non-Indigenous people who are going through a PhD program don't have any trauma, and you may or may not. Yeah. But I think for Indigenous people, Indigenous graduate students, it's an incredibly unique situation for us because a lot of us are, you know, intergenerational survivors. Exactly. That's in our DNA. Like, the genetic component of trauma it is passed down in your DNA. Mm-hmm. So whether or not you had a traumatic experience yourself, it's imprinted on you from your parents or even your grandparents. Like that's that's something that you know epigenetics is is looks at. And so I feel like there needs to be more of a conversation around supporting indigenous peoples, indigenous graduate students and even undergraduates yeah. because we are not getting a fair shake at this. Like we are starting I like 20 steps behind everyone else. Yeah. yeah. Wow. I love how you said that. It makes, yeah, it is like, it, we're not getting a fair shake at this. And, and low key, I feel like our generation of PhDs, when we get through this, things are, things are going to smooth out for the programs because we'll be the advisors. You know, we, we may be in those positions that determine how our departments and programs operate efficiently. Um, because I feel today that a lot of departments and a lot of programs are dropping the ball and really um, letting their students suffer, or even in some cases throwing them under the bus because mo- majority of indigenous students that I talk to who are in grad school, it's hit or miss with the programs. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's hit or miss. So it's cool. You're, you're, we're normalizing this conversation and, and you're hitting everything on the head in terms of mental health and, and how we have to support Indigenous students differently. And like, even if you just look at the pandemic year, you know, the discovery, well, not the discovery, but, you know, the the identifying of where, where these graves were for residential school children, that's all real ongoing stuff for us. It's not like a secondary experience. It's not like just the news at 11 p.m. It's like literally our story. And our programs and a lot of departments and administrations, they don't have the emotional intelligence to offer the support. 
<laughs> which is ironic, right? Because it's a place of intelligence, but they don't have like an emotional intelligence to foster community, love, support, and and help people motivate and navigate. And yeah, that experience, like really, it knocked me out. And I didn't realize, I didn't realize it until my therapist, um, who is Indigenous, kind of sat me down and was like, okay, you know, you're, you're having some reactions right now. You're feeling very reactive. What has happened in the past month? And then she pointed out they excavated the uh, Kamloops into Indian residential school. And I thought, yeah, you know, my, I haven't, I have two aunts, um, not blood related, uh, who, who went to that school. And I was getting a call from my one aunt who is, um, she was my mother's best friend, um, about how she was just struggling. And I thought, whoa, this is, this is like in my family. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, that really kind of stirred up a lot of trauma and stress for me. And, you know, meanwhile, I'm kind of sitting here in my office and I'm berating myself for not getting any work done. I'm getting foggy headed. I'm kind of, you know, my progress is really at a bit of a standstill. And I thought, well, you know what? (laughs) The reason for that is because I'm having a trauma response. I'm being activated by this experience of reading in the news almost on a daily basis on my socials with yeah. blowing up with this. It's a constant reminder. And so I'm, I'm sitting there. I'm like, yeah, I'm, I'm reacting. I got to step back. I have to, I have to kind of move away from this for now because it is having a physical response yeah. in my body. And so, you know, other indigenous graduate students and, I, I suspect some of them, if not all of them, were probably in the same boat. Yeah, yeah, definitely relatable. It's definitely relatable on my front. And 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 I know we just entered another semester, and there wasn't much conversations in terms of like mental health and support on some yeah. in some organizations and departments and institutions. It was sort of just like you merged into an academic semester, and and that baffled me in hindsight. Like I was like, wait a minute. You know, we just came out of this really traumatic summer and now we're expected, expecting our young people to perform and get straight A's. It just baffles me. <laughs> yeah. And I mean, that's the, that's the colonial institution, right? That's yeah. the expectation that you have to perform regardless. Like this, there's no holding of space for, for our students, right? Yeah. There's no acknowledging that they're, they're suffering and they're struggling. So yeah. I just you know, possibly going forward in, in my PhD, in my academic career, this is something that I'll probably, you know, take forward and, and keep pushing for because, I mean, how many Indigenous students at the undergraduate level, for instance, have dropped out yeah. because, you know, unknowingly to them, they're having a trauma response because mm-hmm. they're, you know, faced with all of this oppressive colonial information and yeah. and you know basically the institution itself is telling them and trying to mold them to this standard that's just completely mm-hmm. unrealistic yeah and even like how many hate it right so how many hate academia and university because of that which is yeah. normal that's fine that's great and like i i i love to win over students who have that type of bite and fight because their critical analysis is always on point it's like yeah. they're calling out the institution. And if this student walked away from this space, you know, fine by them. But then at the same time, it's like that's a very real critical response to the times we're living in is a lot of them hate academia. Yeah, I think, you know, I've seen a lot of people criticize the academic institutions from the outside. And I feel mm-hmm. like there's a lot of really great theorizing and thinking going on from outside of the institution that in some ways, um, especially in terms of the land back movement and the environmental um, movement with Indigenous peoples, that's theorizing leaps and bounds ahead of what's going on in academia. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, people on the outside are able to criticize the institution, I think, from a better vantage point than those Mm. who are inside. But at the same time, you know, you're inside and you're able to see the operations and what's going on and you're able to kind of push back and criticize. So, you know, best of both worlds, I think. But yeah, it's it sure is hard on the inside. (laughs) It is, especially me. I'm at University of Saskatchewan, and we're always in the media, it seems. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I saw that about the, um, what was her name, Barassa? Yeah, Carrie Barassa, yeah. 
Yeah. <laughs> so I follow uh, Daryl LaRue oh, okay. on Twitter. Yeah. And he's, um, I think he's at um, uh, Memorial University. But he does a lot of work on uh, race shifting. And so I, I encourage anybody who's really interested in that subject matter about these pretend Indians to uh, follow Daryl LaRue and also Kim Talbert. She talks a lot about this kind of um, race shifting and, and how non-Indigenous people are trying to take up um, Indigenous identity and, and all of this. And so, you know, they want to be us without the struggle that we have, you know, taking our research dollars and stuff. And it's, it's just, it makes it really hard for, you know, especially those of us that are in the institution trying to do good work. Yeah. Yeah, totally. Awesome. Nice. Any other shout outs you want to give? Anything else you want to mention? Not that I can think of, no. <laughs> yeah. This has been an awesome episode. I really enjoyed sitting down with you because you're hitting everything on the head in terms of what Radical Narrative tries to do in terms of our audience both being academic and, and non-academic. We welcome all our listeners. Um, mm. But that's sort of like the two demographics that we tend to have. And yeah, you're really on point with everything. Awesome. Well, thanks for having me. I'm glad we were able to have this conversation. Yeah, yeah, me too. If, if people want to get a hold of you, how do they get a hold of you? If people want more information on chronic waste and disease, um, how would they find that? Um, so right now, if anybody like has uh, a burning need to get a hold of me, they can get a hold of me through my email. Um, I won't give that out right now, but if you want to make that available uh, on your website, that's okay. perfectly fine. Yeah. Um, but for the most part, I'm on Twitter very sporadically. Uh, I follow Indigenous Twitter mostly. Um, I tend to keep kind of a low profile in terms of online presence. But I think uh, at this point, I do need to put together a, uh, a web page for myself so I can start posting um, conversations and lectures and stuff that I'll be giving in the future. Cool. And then information about chronic waste and disease, where would they find that? Like any resources available? Um, you can find uh, information on chronic wasting disease. Uh, the Alberta government has some good information. Um, if you want to kind of wander through their their chronic wasting disease page, um, it's very labyrinth like, um, but there is a lot of information there. In terms of information for uh, Indigenous peoples, I mean, basically at this point, you just kind of have to suss through what the provinces are making available. Uh, I don't know that the Saskatchewan government has a lot of information out there because I know they've been kind of lax on it. Um, but Alberta has um, some some information for the public. Cool. Awesome. Thanks. This has been an amazing hour. Um, yeah, I really enjoyed it. And thanks for making the time for us. Yeah, no problem. Thanks for having me. Great. Thank you. We'll edit this up, send it your way. And once you give the approval, we'll launch it. Awesome. Thanks. Great. Thanks, Arlena. I appreciate it.